I wasn't seeking any knowledge. But you know what? Knowledge kept coming and finding me. One of the most amazing places that I was getting Dawa from was from Somalian taxi drivers. In London, it, the majority of taxi drivers in North London are Somalis. And may Allah be pleased with them because they are the secret army of Islam. Right now, as I'm speaking to you, somewhere in the world, a non-Muslim man or woman is getting into a taxi cab and the Somalian taxi driver is sharing a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that person is being filled with curiosity at least, and possibly even love for Islam. So I would get into these taxi cabs and I would say Salam Alaikum because I'd been to Palestine and the driver would always be interested. You speak a bit of Arabic. Oh, you know a bit of Islam. And then they would say, as the prophet said to his wife, Aisha, da 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 da. And they would give me a hadith or a surah from the Quran. And it got to the stage where I looked forward to getting into these taxis and learning more. You see? My heart was being softened for Islam. Of course, each of us must have a relationship with the Quran. And I did open the Quran before I came to Islam, but only once. I was given a Quran on the streets of Al Quds, Jerusalem, by a young Palestinian man I'd never met before and I'd never see again. He said, This is a gift to you from the people of Palestine. Don't forget us when you leave us. When I got home, I opened the Quran. I washed my hands. I didn't know about wudu, but I opened the Quran and I thought, I like the Muslims. They're good people. Let me find out what their book says. But Al Fatiha seemed strange to me. I turned more pages. The book seemed to be shouted commands, and the voice seemed rather threatening. I felt scared. Imagine being scared of the Quran. But you know, Allah is the all-knowing and the all-wise. And if you come to the Quran in disbelief, or Allah has not prepared you for the Quran, it's not open to you. And at that point, it wasn't open to me. It was literally a closed book. I shut the Quran and I put it on a top shelf out of respect. And I never opened it again until after I'd said my Shahada. Can you imagine? In 2008, I got an email that would change my course of my life again. It said two things. Would you like to come to Gaza by boat? And call this number if you'd like to come to Gaza by boat. It was such a strange email. No boats had been to Gaza in Palestine for 44 years. Because before that, the Israelis had blown up the only boat that was going to go there in the 70s and had killed the organizers who were trying to sail to Palestine. But in 2008, a group of women from America started the Free Gaza Movement. And they invited people around the world to break the siege of Gaza, a cruel, illegal siege, inhumane. The two boats left from Cyprus and guess what? I was on one of the boats. I did call that number. I remember sailing overnight, 36 hours from Cyprus to Gaza. We'd all written our wills. I'd said goodbye to my children in a Skype message. And the next day on August the 23rd, 2008, Gaza rose out of a mist. It was the greatest day of my life. And I know nobody on those boats will forget it. As we got closer, there were dots in the distance, and these dots turned into people, tens of thousands of people. And they were shouting one thing, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. You see, the Palestinian people thought the world actually cared about them at that moment. It was something great to be a part of. 
We were only supposed to stay three days and then t three days with the people of Palestine, then take the boats and leave for the safety of Cyprus. I had two young daughters who were in France. But somehow on the third day, I was there on the dock waving the boats away. My only certain exit from Palestine, from Gaza, was gone. I can't explain to you why I did that. Only Allah knows. It took me 30 days to leave Palestine. The Israelis wouldn't let me leave Eretz crossing. And the Mubarak regime guards would not let me leave through Egypt. I was trapped. I was trapped in Ramadan, in Gaza, with Muslims under oppression. And what a lesson that would be, subhanAllah. I thank Allah every day for that opportunity to be with the greatest Muslims of the Ummah today, the people who can teach us all the meaning of Alhamdulillah, the meaning of Al-Fatiha. That's in Gaza right now. I remember one night I went to have iftar with a very poor family in a place whose name I remembered, Rafa, the refugee camp where you may remember Faris Odeh had come from. A woman opened the door of a room in the refugee camp and she said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. She seemed so happy I couldn't understand it. When I went in, she lived in a hovel. I asked her, why do you fast in Ramadan? It makes no sense to me. Your God makes you hungry. Your God makes you thirsty. Why are you fasting? This mother of Rafa turned to me and she said, with a face so full of light, I fast in Ramadan to remember the poor. I remember those words because she was so poor herself and she didn't seem to realize it because she was just grateful to Allah for whatever she had. And at that moment a key went into my heart and the words came to me, if this is Islam, I'm in. But guess what? Allah calls us the insan and the minute I left that refugee camp, I forgot the feeling. But Here's the miracle. In the intervening years, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never forgot me. Two years later, I went into a mosque during Ramadan and I said a simple prayer. And as I sat down, I was surrounded by such immense peace and joy that I knew Islam was the truth. Seven days later in London, I went into another mosque. And I said the words, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And I became a Muslim. And now, this is my second Ramadan. And my daughters are fasting with me. And our life is one of completeness and gratitude. Gratitude to Allah for guiding us to this beautiful faith. And gratitude to all of you for being my sisters and my brothers. So I make da'a that, like me, you will today recognize that Alhamdulillah is the strongest word we can be saying. Because you and I, we have freedom. You and I, we have children who are well. You and I, we have Islam. So please remember to thank Allah every minute of the day for the blessings he's given you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.